Today, we're going to begin our discussion of kind of a general framework for thinking about authoritarianism. So we're not going to actually talk about the Chinese Communist Party too much today, although I will mention it with examples. Uh, but the goal for you today is to kind of come away with the general sense of the authoritarian world, what it means to be an authoritarian system, uh, and what are the general strategies that authoritarian rulers use to try to stay in power. Uh, before we get into that, I want to just briefly talk about three logistical things. The first is precept. So again, precept will start next week. Uh, in advance of the precept, I will send you a list of readings that we will focus on. Uh, so every week, I'm going to tell you what we're going to cover so you can focus on preparing that uh, for the precept discussion. Um, and you are all slotted into your precepts at this point. Uh, you should no longer be in kind of P99 or whatever it was. Um, we might make some minor adjustments to that because one of the precepts has too many people in it. But overall, you should be pretty much set in stone so you can think about uh, your other parts of your schedule. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up is lunches. So I, I do try to get to know you uh, over the course of the semester. There's a lot of you this year. Um, and if you'd like to get to know me, one thing I try to do is I have lunches uh, throughout the semester, either in Frist or the dining halls or, or maybe a meeting club or two. So I will send out an email. Um, those lunches are entirely optional. If you don't want to have lunch with me, please don't. Uh, it's awkward for everybody if you don't want to be there. Um, so, but if you want to get to, to know me a little bit and maybe have a discussion about China that's not, not in the course, um, we can arrange for that. So, uh, and then the final thing, I'm going to start a class discussion board on Piazza. Uh, this has failed every year. <laughs> So, and the reason why it failed um, is what I've been told is there's this dynamic where no one wants to be seen as contributing because you get labeled a quote, try hard, <laughs> which, is, which is a word that is new to me, but I've learned what it means. Um, honestly, that's deeply sad to me. Um, I, I'm not, I know I joke around a lot, but, but I'm going to be a little bit more serious. This is Princeton. Um, you've all tried hard at different stages in life, and showing effort, seriously, showing effort in a course should not be something you're embarrassed about. Um, that said, in order to facilitate discussion, um, what we're going to do is it's going to be a student-only chat group. So it's not like you're going to get some brownie points from me or the preceptors for being on this discussion board. It's entirely for you. Uh, so you can answer each other's questions. You can ignore each other's questions. You cannot go on it at all. Uh, I don't care. But my point is that I'd like you to have a forum for which you can connect with each other to talk about China um, for those of you who are really interested in China. So that will be on Piazza, and I will try to set that up this week or next. And again, the rule is we will never check it. So it's, it's entirely for you. Uh, and the last thing I would say is on the readings. Uh, so on the syllabus, you'll notice that there are readings that are marked with an open box and readings that are marked with a dot you only have to read the ones with an open box. Some of you have emailed me being like, my god, there are way too many readings. How do I keep up? And I feel sad for you, because you probably read like 1,000 pages that you did not. <laughs> so the, the suggested readings are just there for you if you're interested in diving deeply into a topic for like a senior thesis, or just for your own reading, or for a response paper, or something like that. But it's, those are meant to give you readings beyond the course, but they are certainly not required. OK, any questions on logistics? Sure, yeah. Did you try to turn off the microphone on the table with giving some feedback? You're correct. I can hear it. We have a, can you turn off the microphone on the table? Or do I have to do that? I can probably do it. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> he says before he can't figure out. <laughs> turn off the microphone. All right. I, uh, OK, good, thanks for that. Um, OK, so let's get started. So the goal for today is really first to introduce you to kind of what do we mean by authoritarianism. We've already brought it up a little bit, but let's get into more detail. Uh, and then introduce our key framework, and then we're going to close with uh, one of our class exercises. So how do we define democracy last time? Does anybody remember the key, key component to defining democracy, either in Svolik or from the lecture last week? Just went right through you. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So the, the key to our understanding of democracy is the electoral process. 
And again, the electoral process has to be real. It has to be free and fair, and it has to mean something. This is a slightly more specific version of that definition um, from Spolik. Uh, and this is how he classifies things into democracy or not. Um, free and fair competitive legislative elections or an executive elected directly in free and competitive elections or directed, elected indirectly by a legislature. Um, so we have to have free and fair elections at some point in the system. Notice here that there's a tendency in this field to, to make things into binaries. So you're either democracy or you're authoritarian. There are some people that view that this is too simplistic, right? So there are some countries that are more authoritarian than others. There are some countries that are more democratic than others. So in, in this discussion, I will use this binary definition, but I want you to be thinking about, all right, does this actually make sense? Does it capture the nuance in the political world? Um, so nevertheless, if we use that definition, uh, we can look at the, basically the health of democracy over time. Um, and this chart shows the number of dictatorships. That's the kind of that gray mass. Um, and that uh, the black bar is the percentage of dictatorships over time as a percentage of all countries. So I want you to take a minute. This could go horribly wrong because there's so many of you. But take a minute, talk to the person next to you. What jumps out to you about this chart? What are the big trends? Take one minute, and then please come back to me quickly because it got too chaotic last time. So take one minute, and then we'll come back. Go. What jumps out to you? <laughs> All right, let's bring it back. I wish I could take a picture, but it's sort of inappropriate. But it's fun to watch because you're all sitting there. People are going like this, and <laughs> fun shapes and pointing going on. Um, all right, so what jumps out to you? What are the what are the trends that you notice? Yes. Uh, so the, over, the overall trend is downwards, but around the seventies or so, you have a discrepancy between the percentage and the number of dictatorships, which probably means you need to be creation of something. Yeah, and actually, I, I didn't highlight this, but you see um, change in the number of dictatorships are these bars at the, at the bottom there. So you can see that pop up. So what's going on in the 60s and 70s that might explain this kind of upward trend? Yeah. Well, it's such a big, big period. Yeah, right. So these are sort of post-colonial independence movements. Um, and so a lot of these new democracies that are created, much of them in the developing world, uh, are in fact not democratic, according to this definition. So we actually see an explosion of authoritarian rule. Good. What else? There's also maybe propagation of authoritarian regimes during the Cold War. Okay, right. So we see generally a, a seminal increase during the height of the Cold War uh, for various reasons. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, also, the instability that that created in Vietnam War. Okay. So in that, it was starting to happen. Okay. Um, what about kind of the temporal trends more recently? Okay, right, so we see a massive drop um, corresponding with the fall of the Soviet Union, right? Um, so this is the end of a lot of one-party systems. This data actually only goes through 2008. Um, I believe if you were to examine it for the last six or seven years, uh, there might be a slight uptick in authoritarian rule. And so there's a lot of discussion in political science now about what's known as democratic backsliding. So countries that were once democratic falling back into authoritarian rule. And a lot of these countries that transition, democracy is not inherently a stable system. A lot of countries that are democratic can, can transition back to authoritarian rule. Um, and so we might see a slight uptick in that. 
Um, when we think about authoritarian regimes, in some sense, it's a little silly uh, to, to call this one category because there's a lot of, of different types of authoritarian regimes. Uh, Spolitz does a nice job of, in that reading of breaking down authoritarianism into different dimensions. Um, and so we used to think about authoritarian regimes as this is a monarchy, this is a one-party authoritarian regime. Spolitz tells us, look, we actually just need to be thinking about specific dimensions of governance and why those dimensions matter. And I should say that that data is available for any of you who are interested in data. Uh, if you just Google uh, politics of authoritarian rule, uh, and go to Milan Spolik's website, you will find his data, and it's, it's super easy to use and, and very interesting. Um, and so he tends to classify these things across uh, five, uh, four key dimensions, military involvement in politics, whether or not they're political parties, how the legislative branch is selected if it exists, and same for executive selection. Um, and so again, some of these temporal trends over time, you might have already seen these charts, but just to go through them. Uh, First of all, where would China fall? Is China, in terms of parties, where would China fall? Again, I think we covered this last week, but just to resummarize, is China a parties band, multiple parties, or a single party state? Single party. All right. You've learned that. You have that. All right. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so again, China would be considered a single party state. Um, we see a dramatic decrease in the number of single party states following the end of the Cold War, right? So we see countries that were once single party states seem to be becoming multiple party authoritarian regimes. Um, and so there are a lot of authoritarian regimes out there that have opposition parties, uh, but those opposition parties cannot compete in a free uh, electoral competition. Right? So they are, they are disadvantaged by some means in the electoral process. China is unique, in my opinion at least, in that there is no organized opposition in Chinese society. Okay, so there are democratic parties that exist in China today, but they are under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. They're not actual political parties in any meaningful sense. The Chinese Communist Party has no opposition party as a counterweight, and that is important to keep in mind. Um, another thing to keep in mind, all right, so legislative concentration of power. So again, these regimes vary in whether or not they have legislatures and whether or not these institutions, how they are elected, how they are chosen. Does anyone know where China might fall in this grouping? Anybody have a guess? You can't be wrong. Well, you can be wrong, but it doesn't matter. So just take a risk, live the dream. Interesting. So actually, um, the, the answer that Svolik gives, which took me a while to wrap my own head around, is one party or candidate per seat for the legislature. Um, I actually study China's legislat legislative system, and there are multiple candidates that compete for these seats, but they actually tend to all be from the Communist Party, or they are, their nomination process is in some sense dictated by the Communist Party. So this is how Svolik would classify China, but your characterization of one party controls more than 75% of seats I think he would say that doesn't work because there are no other parties really in China. That would be his argument. But the point here that I want you to take away is that China does have legislative institutions. Not all authoritarian regimes even bother to have them. Okay? Uh, in terms of the electoral process, again, where would China, this is sort of a repeated theme here, so where would China potentially fall on this chart? So selected by a small unelected body seems to be a fair choice for me. He classifies China as a one party, one party candidate. So perhaps one thing to take away from this is sometimes we make these typologies and we try to put countries in boxes, but when we actually get to the nuances of how things work, it can be a little bit, there can be some gray areas. So I think your answer to me sounds plausible as well. But um, in general, uh, we would consider China to have a non-competitive, executive selection mechanism. So, so for some countries, for some authoritarian regimes, they have elections uh, for the executive, for the presidency, and they're not entirely fraudulent. There's actual something resembling electoral competition. Xi Jinping is chosen through an internal party process which is ratified through a rubber stamp parliament months later. Okay, so this is an entirely internal kind of closed room, smoke-filled room decision-making process at the executive level. So that's just kind of how China stacks up. To me, this is the 
biggest takeaways from Skolik, and as a, as a scholar of authoritarian politics, this was eye-opening to me to just see this data. Um, the key thing to remember is that authoritarian regimes die in any number of ways. Uh, they can die through a coup d'etat, a popular uprising, a transition to democracy, an assassination, or foreign intervention. The most the striking thing about this figure is that most authoritarian regimes, the most pressing threat to them is actually the threat from each other, the threat from within. A coup d'etat is when someone from within the ruling regime seizes power from the existing dictator. And that is how 70%, roughly 70% of authoritarian regimes fall. Um, the more kind of romantic version of how authoritarian regimes fall would be some of these other categories, like a transition to democracy, um, kind of a popular uprising, a revolution. Right? So the masses coming together, demanding <laughs> political change, and leading to some, to some transformation. But that, and that is a very real issue. That's roughly 10 to 20 percent of cases, depending on how you lump things together. But those are the two key, key dilemmas facing the authoritarian regime, and that's what I want to focus on in this course. So we can think about these are the two problems facing any authoritarian ruler, contestation from within. How do I, if I'm a dictator, if I'm Xi Jinping, how am I managing other elites within the Chinese Communist Party, especially more prominent elites, potentially economic elites or military elites? How do I keep them on my team to avoid a coup? And then the second dilemma is, how do I avoid a popular uprising? How do I keep the population in line? Uh, and so what I'd like to do is just introduce a, oh, I had a little problem with my computer here. Um, introduce a very simple framework for thinking about this. And, and in political science, we're going to do this a few times this semester, but in political science, there's a, a tendency to want to take the political world and abstract it down to something manageable. Uh, and so this is, this is often what you'll see in game theory for those of you who do economics. Uh, we're trying to develop kind of generalizable simple theories of the political world. Uh, and often in political science, we make a distinction between these three actors. So let's introduce the actors. The first actor is the dictator. Uh, the dictator I think of as a single individual. Um, and this is the leader of the country. It's often in some authoritarian regimes, it's not clear who's quite the leader. In China's case, currently, it's, it's pretty darn clear, uh, Xi Jinping. Um, but it's not always the case. But the most important thing to remember here is that this is the person that is, is the face of the regime. This is the person running the show, uh, the most senior leader. Some people might say, oh, we can think of the regime as being the Paul Perot Standing Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. It doesn't quite matter to me. Um, the goal of the leader, we can say, the goal of the dictator is simply to stay in office. And that's a simplifying assumption. Right? Some leaders might have policy goals, they might want to leave a certain legacy, they might be ideologues, they might have an ideological agenda. But the most simple assumption we can make is that most of these people want to continue to rule. Okay, so that's their end game, that's what they're trying to achieve. Uh, the second group that we're going to be interested in is the citizenry. This is a fancy, not even fancy, just another word for the population. Okay, so these are normal people. Um, and we lump them all together in this framework. We could think of them, if we wanted to, as disaggregated into different groups, maybe of different ethnicities or geographic locations. But sometimes it's helpful just to think of them as one. Okay, so the first strategic interaction is between the dictator and the citizenry. The dictator wants to stay in power. What does the citizenry want? The citizenry wants, in general, what we think of as the citizenry wants some welfare. Right, so they want to maximize their own uh, personal income or maximize their, their closeness of the policy to their own policy preferences. They want good policy making. They want welfare benefits. They want health care. They want education. They want property rights and so forth. Um, what are the tools through which, so now we have a basic sense. Dictator wants to stay in power. Citizens want some welfare standard. Uh, what are the tools that each actor has to deal with the other? So the first is, for the citizenry, the key tool that the citizenry has in an authoritarian regime is the threat of revolution. Okay? Many people will say, oh, there's no accountability in an authoritarian regime. If elections aren't there, the only way to have accountability is with elections. If there aren't good elections, that means there's no accountability. I think that's my personal st stance is that that's just simplifying and, and, and pretty wrong. 
accountability and authoritarian regimes doesn't come through elections. It comes through the threat of revolution, the threat of violence and protest. Um, and even when a system is not currently in revolution, or not currently, citizens aren't currently protesting, it doesn't mean that that threat is gone. It's always lurking in the background. If you're Xi Jinping, if you're the Chinese Communist Party, your goal is to avoid another Tiananmen Square protest, another democracy wall movement, any sort of mass movement aimed at regime change. That is your nightmare scenario. We can define revolution. This is a hard term to define, but we can, we can define it as extra constitutional effort to overthrow a non-democratic regime through a large scale popular movement. Um, this is a definition I'm actually forgetting where I pulled it from, but there's a couple of features that I want to I want to draw to your attention. The first is it's extra constitutional, meaning it's outside the formal, legal, or institutional context. These are extraordinary events. When they do occur, they're extremely rare. Um, in this instance, I said to overthrow a non-democratic regime. Um, we can think of revolutions over time as generally having this character, although not all of them do. But for the purposes of this, we'll keep them in, in that category. And the, the key aspect of this is it's a large-scale popular movement. So it's, it has to have a mass mobilization component to it. It may or may not be violent. It may devolve into a civil war. Uh, but the point is that it's a, a large scale popular movement. Keys, key examples of revolutions in Chinese history, the, the one that we're going to study the most, uh, will be the Tiananmen Square protest. This is Chai Ling, uh, who was the, one of the student leaders of the Tiananmen Square movement. She actually came to Princeton following the Tiananmen Square movement. She did her master's at the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, believe it or not. Um, but so this is an example of Tiananmen Square protest is an example of, in the Chinese system, actually a failed revolution, a, a near revolution. Um, so that's the key tool that the citizenry has. Now what can the dictator do to manage the population? I would argue that there's four general categories of tools that are used. And the remainder of the course, once we get through the history, will be focusing on the four tools. The first tool would be what we would call repression. Repression is a, a big concept. It's kind of a blanket word. Uh, we can define it as any tool to prevent citizen expression through the use of force, punishment, uh, and intimidation. Um, so this includes everything from torture, uh, forced detention. In China, there's a phenomenon called being taken for tea, uh, where local officials, usually from the Public Security Bureau, will invite people to t drink tea, uh, but this is a, f a form of intimidation. So uh, this is kind of like the, the more violent, brutish side of authoritarian rule. All authoritarian leaders have some repressive, coercive capacity uh, to their rule. This can also take the form of more dramatic events. This is the, the famous tank man image from Tiananmen Square, um, where the, the, the <coughs> dictator is actually responding to a revolution with repression. But more often, actually, repression is kind of very quiet and in the background humming along, uh, affecting only a few people, mostly the dissident population. All right, so if I'm a dictator and I'm trying to stay in, off, in power and you are the citizenry and you're potentially trying to overthrow me if you're particularly unsatisfied, I can repress you, okay? I can use the, the institutions of repression to keep you down and intimidate you and make you scared. Another tool would be what I would call redistribution. Okay, redistribution the way I'm using it here is, again, a broader term to capture just the provision of goodies, okay? Provision of wealth and public good and responsiveness to citizen demands. This isn't actually, it can be in part like actual fiscal redistribution, actually financial transfer. But I would, I would call things like building roads, um, ensuring economic development, and other, other aspects uh, of this nature, quasi-democratic institutions. Any, policy or practice designed to respond to citizen demands. So if I'm trying to stay in power, I can repress you, or I can just listen to you and try to govern well and keep you happy. Um, and actually, often when we talk about authoritarian rule, we forget about this. And often when we talk about the Chinese Communist Party, we forget about this as well. Um, and so many people believe that one of the main reasons why the Communist Party is in power Sure, it's highly repressive and very sophisticated in that regard. But in terms of policy responsiveness and redistribution, uh, this is a government that, again, has lifted 400 to 600 million people out of poverty in the last 30 years. So that's a key source of legitimacy. All right, tool number three. 
would be what we would define as co-optation. So if I'm trying to keep you down, if I'm trying to stay in power, I can repress you, I can listen to you and respond, or I can bring you in. I can bring you into the ruling regime. Uh, so the strategy of co-optation is just a, a fancy way of saying bringing people from the population into the regime, into the ruling coalition. And this doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm taking citizens and putting them in, in the Politburo Standing Committee. Um, this can be something much larger than that. The Communist Party itself has 98 million people. It's the largest political party in the world. So we could argue that the Communist Party is co-opting members of society by bringing them into the party itself, not necessarily at the elite level. Most average party members don't have any real power, but they get a vested interest. They have a vested interest in the success of the regime. We're going to talk about this in more detail. One, one way we've seen this uh, in the past manifest itself is through managing of ethnic minorities in China. So if you're an ethnic minority, uh, in the political system, there's actually provisions that guarantee you representation in the parliament. Uh, and representation in other institutions within the Chinese Communist Party. We've seen a lot of co-optation of business people in the last 20 years. So once upon a time, business people were labeled rightists and capitalists and were not allowed in the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, there's actually a lot of uh, discussion of this in the, in the 2000s that the party has basically welcomed so-called red, ca red capitalists, welcomed business people into the party. So this is a way, again, of co-opting them, giving them a vested interest in the system. If I'm in the system, I'm going to be less likely to challenge it. Here's an image of um, <clears throat> ethnic minority delegates to China's National People's Congress. They are actually required to wear their ethnic dress, I believe, at least for the first day. This is not an accident. Uh, this is a way these sorts of images are put on state-owned media. This is a way to show ethnic minorities <laughs> that the party is inclusive. Okay, this is a form of co-optation. Okay, uh, the final tool, which is a big one, and, I, and in my opinion, kind of the more sinister one and fascinating one of, of the Chinese Communist Party, is the, is the use of manipulation. So if I'm trying to stay in power, and you're the citizenry, I can repress you, I can intimidate you, make you scared, I can listen to you, I can try to bring you into the regime, or I can shift your understanding of the world around you to make you more complicit with my rule. Okay, I can change your information environment. And I call that manipulation. Uh, manipulation is, again, kind of an umbrella category that would capture things like propaganda, which is the dissemination of positive messages about uh, the regime or the government, and censorship, which is the flip side of that, which is the deletion or the prevention of access for, uh, preventing citizens from acting, accessing critical information or negative information. Uh, so they're kind of two sides of the same coin. And they tend to work in tandem. Combined, that can create citizens that think the Chinese Communist Party is actually a democratic regime, when no political scientists would agree with that. Um, it can combine to create citizens that believe Western democracy is not appropriate for China or that the United States uh, is violent. I had a friend once uh, who used to work for CCTV, and he was in charge of the segment of the news that would show news in the United States. Uh, and he was told to always emphasize news that emphasized the violence in American society. Uh, so people would be showed images of gun deaths and so forth on TV, and that would paint democracy as chaotic. He was also coincidentally show, told to never show an American flag unless it was burning, uh, which is, <laughs> I remember that quote from me. He's like, yeah, we could never show an American flag unless it was burning, and then it was OK. I was like, oh my god. So you know, and all governments do this. There's propaganda. It's, this is not to say there's no manipulation of our own preferences in a Western society. And this is done by news organizations and political parties and private actors. But the key here is that this is regime-sponsored manipulation of information. You know, people, the, the, you would think of kind of propaganda. This is Mao's. Little Red Book, um, images of that during the Cultural Revolution, propaganda images. But actually, much of what happens now is, is much more sophisticated and high tech. Um, so it's not, you walk around China today, you can see images of Xi Jinping and kind of propaganda slogans. But the, the stuff that really matters, much of it is online. Uh, and we're going to read that book by Professor Molly Roberts on censorship, where she really gets at the, the, the nitty gritties of that. 
Okay, so that's kind of the first game that's going on. So I, when I think about authoritarian politics, I think of it as like basically two games that are being played simultaneously. So you have this game between the citizenry, the population, and the regime. The citizenry is threatening to revolt, trying to organize and potentially revolt um, if they are dissatisfied with the regime. And then the regime is using a combination of repression, redistribution, manipulation, and co-optation to try to keep the population at bay. So that's the threat from below. But what we learned is that it's actually the threat from within that is, in some sense, the most pressing or more pressing. Uh, and the threat from within, um, again, let me introduce this third actor, so the ruling coalition. So we have the dictator. The ruling coalition is a somewhat vague term. You'll sometimes hear the word selectorate uh, to describe this. The ruling coalition, when we talk about authoritarian politics, is simply the group of societal elites through which the dictator depends to stay in power. So no dictator can rule a country by himself or herself. Every single dictator relies on the support of some group of elites. Now how big is that group? That's open to debate. If we had to say, what's the ruling coalition in China today? <coughs> is it the Chinese Communist Party itself, 98 million people? That's probably too big. The average party member in a, in a village doesn't matter at all. It might be, we might say it's the National Party Congress, which is a little over 2,000 people. These are the 2,000 most important elites in the Chinese Communist Party. You might say it's that plus the military or maybe heads of key state-owned enterprises and companies. The definition, frankly, I, I don't think it's productive to say who's in the ruling coalition and who is not. The point is that there's a set of elites that have power outside of the dictator, and they have their tool. They don't stage revolutions. They stage coups. Right, so they can threaten a coup and try to remove the dictator through violent means. Um, and there are, I'm, I'm hesitant to show this. This is a, a, a news story from 2012 from, frankly, a news source that is, has no repute. I can't even remember where it came from. But in discussion forums over the last six years, there's been discussions of coup attempts going on in China at different points in time. We don't really know if they happened. You don't know if a coup happened unless it succeeds, right? So this could just be rumors. It could be nothing. But within the last five years, there's been maybe two or three instances where I've heard rumors of coup attempts going on uh, within China. That could be just rumors. It could be bad journalism. You will not see major news outlets <laughs> report on coup, so-called coup rumors because they're just, there's not enough factual basis to them. But this is just a way for me to, to show you that there is some relevance when we think about contemporary China, that the, the threat of a coup against Xi Jinping, it's a possibility. Is it happening? Probably not, but it is a possibility that people are thinking about. Um, so the ruling coalition has the threat of staging a coup. If you're the dictator, what can you do? What are the tools you have? Well, you can purge and promote people. That's the, the first main tool. To purge is, someone, is to simply remove somebody. So to try to remove them from the system, to debase them, to remove them from the ruling coalition. And this is, again, often through extra legal or violent means. This can be actually assassinating somebody, or it can be uh, using existing institutions to take them out. Uh, famous examples of this, which we're going to study in more detail. Uh, this is Zhou Yongkang, who was a rival to Xi Jinping. Um, and who was a former Politburo Standing Committee member, so a key member within the Chinese Communist Party, and he was investigated for corruption several years ago, right when Xi Jinping was consolidating power. Uh, Xi Jinping has removed several top-level leaders uh, through the anti-corruption campaign. Are they being removed because they are corrupt? Maybe, or are they being removed because they are against him? and a rival faction. It's, it's unclear. Uh, but if you look at purges at the elite level, people being removed at the elite level, there tends to be a pattern where they're generally not viewed as Xi Jinping supporters, and then they are removed. Uh, conversely, you can promote people, right? So you can cultivate a base of support and try to pack the elite institutions of the party or of the regime, whatever regime you're of, uh, with your allies. And this is, again, a key feature of the Communist Party. Um, it's a lot of senior level leaders have ex deep, deep patronage networks extending all the way down at very low levels of government to people who are very young. 
And it seems to be often a game of trying to get my people promoted and up. If I get my people promoted, that means I am more powerful. The power in the Chinese system is based on networks and your, the power of your network versus somebody else. So I can try to play this game of purging and promoting to stave off a coup and debase my enemies. The other feature of this is I can try to keep the ruling coalition happy by giving them goodies. And the, the fancy term for this would be called rent distribution. Uh, so this is the provision of benefits or policy influence. It can be money, it can be private material benefits, or it can be influence to members of the ruling coalition to try to keep them at bay, to keep them invested in the political system. Uh, again, this is a key feature of the Chinese political system. You, once upon a time, it used to be commonplace for there to be large banquets uh, with high-level party members. So it, it's good to be an elite member of the Chinese Communist Party. Since the anti-corruption campaign, some of these banquets um, have been kind of toned down. But the broader takeaway I want, want you to, to come away with is that the use of corruption is actually strategic. Uh, in some sense, it's like a gang. So you, you'll hear about gangs sometimes in the United States uh, will force new members to commit a crime. Uh, and this kind of binds them to the gang because now they're guilty, they're all in it together. My opinion is that corruption in China kind of operates in the same way. Most people at the senior level, uh, often through their family members and their personal networks, could be plausibly investigated for corruption, and that actually binds them all together. So corruption is like a glue. Um, there are, it, it prevents people from defecting. If I want to defect, stage a coup, or stage some sort of promote myself and, and, and try to become the next president, um, I, there's dirt, there's enough dirt on me that I could be taken out. So I think that's, in my mind, how, how some of this stuff operates. So again, so the, the game between the dictator and the ruling coalition is the threat of a coup and then the use of these two tools to try to stave that off. So then we put everything together, um, and actually it starts to get pretty complicated uh, because, do you have a question? Or are you just, question. where did you come from? Okay. <laughs> Just sort of like left up right there. Yeah, what's going on? The reason the crime analogy works in the gang is because it's like a tool for enforcement. Yeah. Uh, so there is there is something uh, which the crime makes them outside of, under which they know are no longer receiving protection. Yeah. Uh, or are guilty. What is that analog force in Chinese politics? That is a great question. And you're forcing me to think through my analogies. I mean, I guess one one way. We often think of coups as being a transition from authoritarianism to authoritarianism. Um, but one worry, if you're the dictator, is that let's say there is a revolution, a large scale protest. <coughs> but usually, the only way a revolution succeeds is if somebody within the ruling coalition defects and says, Yeah, I agree, I side with the people. I'm going to lead this democratic transition to something of this nature. And this actually has happened in Chinese history, right? So, so the cannabis term movement narrowly succeeds. Uh, one of the key leaders, which we're going to talk about, Zhao Ziyang, actually briefly came to side with the protesters and that emboldened the protesters. He was removed. Uh, but that, in some sense, the threat is actually the interaction between these two things, so that the ruling coalition can work with the citizenry to try to overthrow the regime. And so if you're corrupt, if you've done you know, all sorts of bad things, it means you can't credibly commit to being kind of the leader of the, the democratic plan or something like that. You're, you're too dirty. You're too complicit in all the bad things that the party has done. Be able to try to really that so maybe that's how I would think about it. That's a good, good question. I appreciate it. Um, all right, so let's keep going. And so these are the two threats. And again, the key takeaway for this lecture um, is that I want you to, to always be thinking about the reason I provide this framework. I know we haven't talked about China all that much today, although we're getting into a little bit, which is good. Is I want you, whenever you read a piece of news or think about a new trend in Chinese politics, in my mind, I immediately go to this. Say, well, how is this going to affect kind of the, the population? Are they going to, is this going to increase the prospect of revolution or decrease it? And similarly, <laughs> how is this going to affect the ruling coalition? Does that face pressure? And so, for example, the trade war. One good response paper, I haven't assi assigned response papers, but I will next week. And so you can start thinking about ideas. How would a trade war uh, affect Xi Jinping's 
prospects for staying in power? Does the trade war make revolution more likely? Does it make a coup more likely? Why? Why not? What can Xi Jinping or other leaders do to respond to these threats? These are the things I want to be thinking about. Um, I want to close, and in that, in that um, vein, I want to spend the last maybe five or six minutes thinking about these questions and kind of getting in the habit of drawing hypotheses out. So one of the key features of political science is that we try to take these sort of abstract ideas and draw out hypotheses. We're trying to emulate science and call ourselves political scientists. It's sort of sad. We're trying to emulate real science. Um, but I want you to get in the habit of being able to take some of these more abstract ideas and then draw an implication out from them that could be potentially testable with a data set like what we see from Skolik or other people. Um, and so let's just get in uh, a, a kind of an exercise where I'm going to come up with a factor and I want you to think through how this might affect the likelihood of a coup. So how is it gonna affect the ruling coalition and the dictator? And how is it going to affect the likelihood of a revolution? There are no right answers to these questions. I have my own intuitions, but they could very well be wrong. Uh, but let's start with one. So China has a parliament. It's called the National People's Congress. It's got 3,000 people in it. Um, it's got hundreds of thousands of people in the system at different levels. So there's provincial people's congresses. There's prefectural people's congresses. There's literally hundreds of thousands of people who are legislators in China. Okay, So how does the existence of that institution, in existence of a parliament, how does that affect the likelihood of a coup and of a revolution? Does it make a coup more likely or less likely if, it, if that institution were not to exist? And same for revolution. Take a minute, talk it through with your close friend sitting next to you now, uh, and then we'll read. All right, 30 more seconds.
There weren't any what? Sorry? Moral vacuums. Moral vacuums. Right. So he could actually show that, you know, some kind of ideology. Okay. And then we thought of all the backwards. There might be maybe like certain attempts to remove people in power who are above um, from power. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff that's all on paper, but that's not really the backwards. We might then move to a purge from top echelon up top, which might then move to a constitution from the military that they hold the balance of power, which may then move to a treaty. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so these are excellent answers, and I, we quickly are realizing that there's, there's a lot of different ways you can theorize this, and I, that's good. And actually, as an instinct, when you're reading a research paper, you should try to attack the person's assumptions or try to complicate things. Uh, so uh, you're already starting to think along these lines. So my personal instinct on the coup front was that it's, it is going to maybe decrease the likelihood. There's a paper actually that shows this. Um, and the argument in that paper is that this is a mechanism. Imagine if there were no parliament, um, then you have no way for elites to kind of have a seat at the table. And so parliaments serve to co-opt elites or kind of bring in, I guess that's the wrong word, um, to kind of bring that rent distribution, serve as a form for rent distribution and policy influence for elites. And that strengthens the bond between the dictator and the ruling coalition. Some of these other ideas I think are quite plausible Parliaments give elites a, a platform through which to exercise power that could go against the regime. Um, your, your answer also had elements of this to it, right? So I think those are interesting things to think about. What about, real quick, um, revolutions? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think it would decrease the likelihood of a revolution because the citizenry feels they need it given that like, we are represented in just a large nature of the parliament. So th this is, again, an argument you see in the literature, is that parliaments stave off the threat of revolution because they are ways for regimes to show that they listen to the population and learn about some grievances within the population. And empirically, again, this is true. So regimes with parliaments tend to last longer and have, are less likely to face the threat of revolution. Um, so we're just about out of time. Um, I will say one last one, real quick. Uh, Anti-corruption campaign. A large-scale anti-corruption campaign where hundreds of thousands of officials are removed <coughs> and investigated for corruption. How is that going to affect the likelihood of a coup? Up or down? Do you think it's going to increase likelihood? Raise your hand. Decrease? Raise your hand. Want to get out of class? Raise your hand. Um, this is something to chew on, maybe something to think about. Um, in, my, in my opinion, my guess would be that it's going to increase the likelihood of a coup because you're drying up that glue, right? So for a long time, the equilibrium has been, I get to be corrupt and then have no problem. Now you're taking away from it, that away from me. I have a reason to fight you. It's going to likely stave off the threat of revolution because it makes the citizens happy. Citizens don't like corruption. So anyway, this is all just speculation, but it's an exercise I want you to get in the habit of. So we'll see you on Thursday. Good job.